Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar with Movella, Jota Racing, and RideStep. Today, the topic of the webinar will be motorsport efficiency, the lower limb loading in endurance, motorsport, and mechanics. We want to all welcome you to this webinar. Um, we will be hosting this from our very nice green room in Enschede, the Netherlands. Um, a few things before we can start. Today, you will see in Livestorm, the app where we host our webinar in, that there is two options. There's a chat window where you can chat with people. However, there's also a specific question section. If you have any questions during the webinar, please post them there. Uh, we will address hopefully all the questions um, at the end of the webinar, where we will host a live Q&A session together with um, Mike Crooks from RightStep and Cassie McCall from uh, Jota Racing. So feel free to post the questions there. If you have any other comments, feel free to post them in the question or in the chat section as well. And we'll try to address them. For example, if you cannot hear us or cannot see us. First, I will start about explaining something about Movella and Xsens, who we are and what we do. Then we will switch over to Cassie and Mike and they will provide you with the insights and the actual content of the webinar. And they will talk about the lower limb loading in endurance motorsport mechanics. So about Movella, who are we? We are uh, the global leader in motion capture technology. Uh, Movella is the mother company of Xsens, which means that we are basically Xsens and selling the Xsens products globally. We have offices in the Netherlands, in the US, in China, even uh, some offices in Latin America. So we are able to provide our technology worldwide. And we have one mission, which is we want to bring meaning to movement. And today in this webinar, we want to bring meaning to movement in applied sports biomechanics. So we want to show you how can you use our technology in an applied setting to get something meaningful from the data, which you can actually use to start improving performance. So Cassie and Mike will be talking about that in a later stage. So Movella, here is a nice overview of some of our customers. We have been providing to many different customers of our products. So you can see their big names like BMW or NASA, but also big universities and sports performance associations like the English Institute of Sports or Aspire Academy. So there's a very broad portfolio. However, Movella is not only health and sports. We have also our systems for entertainment. So we provide information for Netflix, uh, EA Sports, Marvel, Meta. They're all companies that also use our technology for movie productions, games, everything in entertainment. We also have an industrial part, which is our MTI sensors. With our MTI sensors, we have embedded IMU sensors that are being used in drones, airplanes, self-driving cars to provide you with very accurate orientational tracking. So that's a little bit, little bit about what we do with Movella. Um, about our Xsense products, we have the Xsense hardware, which consists of the MVN Awinda and the MVN Link. I'm not going to talk in detail now about these products. Feel free to contact us as Movella if you want to have more information about either the Xsense uh, Awinda system, the MVN Link system, or want to know anything about our software. What is very nice with our software is we provide you a very big bucket of data. However, that can also be the confusing part because how can you get from this big bucket of data into something meaningful, meaningful for your project, for your application, for whatever you want to do with motion capture. So that's where this web webinar today is about. I would love to introduce you to our speakers, Cassie McCall, sports biomechanics um, specialist and she's working with a racing team called Jota Racing, very successful endurance racing team. And she's working together with Mike Crooks. Uh, Mike is from RightStep. Mike provides assistance on how to interpret the data in this specific topic today. Um, I want to wish them a very warm welcome. We will be switching over to their screens now, and then maybe Cassie and Mike can shortly introduce themselves as well. And then uh, we can start with the webinar. Uh, from that side. So if you have any questions, post them in the question section or either feel free to contact us our, afterwards. One other remark, this webinar will be recorded. So 
If you have anything you want to check in a later stage, you want to show somebody else, the webinar will be posted online so you can review it uh, afterwards as well. So I hope you will enjoy this webinar and uh, have fun. And you will see me in a later stage during the Q&A session. All right. OK, so uh, I'm the founder of Brightstep. I'm a software engineer by trade. Um, Brightstep is um, primarily concerned with musculoskeletal loading. Um, and there'll be a short introduction as to what that actually means. Um, in this presentation, I uh, Brightstep has supported Cassie and Jota um, over the last few months to look into this topic. Um, so we're uh, we provide this sort of analytical capability um, within this project, um, and as Jordi sort of implied, we leverage the data that comes out of um, the Xsense products um, in order to do that. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming along. I am a human performance specialist at Jota and I'm lucky enough to work with a prick crew day in, day out, traveling with the team and also at the workshop. So this project started with a small problem that we started to see with the pit crew and uh, Mike kindly got, got in contact with myself and we started to develop this project together. So this is what our presentation and what our findings are. So Jota competes in the World Endurance Championship. And within this, there's lots of manufacturers, Porsche, Toyota, Peugeot, Cadillac, and a lot more coming in. So these big manufacturers and teams are spending millions of dollars to be the fastest car on track. On average, if you want to gain a tenth of speed on track, you need to spend $100,000 per tenth. So it's a lot of money to achieve a little bit of time. So most teams like ours, the easiest and most cost effective way is to drop our pit stop times and try and gain on the other competitors. So in 2019, I joined Jota. And since then, we have developed a very unique program at Jota, where we focus on technique and choreography of the pit crew. So we can increase their efficiency and be the fastest on track. So for many of you, if you're not familiar with World Endurance Championship pit stops, there's a few different reasons why we complete the pit stop. We do it to refuel the car, change the tires, and also maybe if we have suffered damage, provide any repairs that may need be done. The crew will lift wheels around the car so the wheels are roughly about 25 kilos, which the type of wheel you can see is on the left. The gun that the crew use on the right is about seven and a half kilos with a specific socket. And the middle box is our pit box that the cars pull in, just similar to F1. But in WEC, why do these pit stops matter? So in 2021, our Le Mans, we came second by 0.7 of a second. We actually had an issue in pit lane, which resulted us losing 30 seconds. Now, not all races are down to one pinpoint in time, but it does mean that if we hadn't have lost that 30 seconds, we might have had a different result. So that's why it becomes important. Also, our pit stops will have us lose positions like Le Mans, or we gain on other competitors. It also makes it easy for our engineers to make strategy calls so that they can provide the best race possible and get us to that top podium spot the fastest way possible. So this is a pit stop from WEC. So our car comes in, our refueler connects and goes on. You can see we're doing a driver change at this time. So one of the drivers coming out and our next driver's coming in with a driver helper. And you'll see the crew walking around, cleaning windscreens, cleaning headlights, looking for debris on brake ducts, just trying to, in general, maintain the car so it will finish the length of race it needs to. 
we can only change tyres once the fuel has been disconnected. So you'll see now our crew are going into our tyre change where we are changing all four tyres. And as soon as we've done that in the fastest way possible, the car will leave. And that's our pit stop. So a good pit stop is about 12 seconds. A fast pit stop is 11 seconds. And our goal for Jota is a 10 second pit stop, which we are achieving in our races, which is fantastic. So from this, there's a few different issues that present itself. Because we're refueling the car, the pit crew are required to wear fireproof underwear, suits, balaclavas, helmet, goggles, gloves, and fireproof boots. This equipment's great to reduce injury from a result of a fire, but no equipment that a mechanic is wearing has been developed to improve performance. The boots that the mechanics wear are just boots that have been adapted or are boots that rally co-drivers use. So they sit down all the time. They're not running around the car. So this presents a huge problem because by the time we hit Le Mans, which is only the fourth race of our calendar, our pit crew have spent over 300 hours in these pit stop boots. And so from that, we started to see soreness reported in the lumbar spine and the lower body. And out of our 250 incidences of eight athletes, we were seeing a big distribution in the lower body. And this wasn't seen on the days where our mechanics are wearing our runners that a team provide. So this is something that we started to see and we needed to see if it was truly based on pit stop boots, we're seeing a soreness or it just happens to coincide with the long part of the weekend and we are getting fatigue, which is also another issue. So Mike helped me out and I contacted him and he we developed this little project. So we had five pit crew um, volunteer for the study. We did only use male pit crew, A, because Jota only has male pit crew. It's just the way our team has worked. There are not many female mechanics within WEC and just also we wanted to make sure that the gender differences between male and female in running mechanics is vast so we are specifically focusing on males just because that is our team so the crew had accents 17 sensors placed on them and they completed some running trials just on a turf track uh, we have a 10 meter turf track at our gym so they would run up and back a total of 20 meters and that was one trial so they did three trials in our on trainers. So the picture on our left is the team trainers, the entire team wear, and then the pit stop boots on the right, the Alpine Stars pit stop boots. Those are what all of the mechanics wear in pit lane. So immediately you can see a lot of difference between a runner and the pit stop boot in the sole, in the support of the shoe, etc. So it sort of gives us an idea that what we might expect to see. So I'm going to hand over to Mike now because he's going to go through the analysis and the results that we found. Thanks, Mike. Excellent. Thanks, Cassidy. Um, so I, I just want to start off with uh, what I what I like about um, Cassie's approach, and it's it's really uh, I kind of did this analysis like let's say blind because I didn't do the data collection. I'm I'm not with Cassie on a day to day basis, um, but what I like about the approach she's taken is that it's it's a real it's a real problem that the team have noticed. So it could be you know anything like in a football team or a, a tennis individual that there's a problem that's been surfaced that means that there's something that needs to be done to fix it, right? To try and improve things, and then it's not just like let's do a let's do a study for the sake of doing a study, or let's try and find out you know something that takes years to do. This is very practical. Um, I can't stress how, how sort of important I, I believe that to be. Um, so once, you know, Cassie had sort of said, well, there's this, this problem that we're experiencing, um, you know, I was more than, uh, more than excited to say the least to get involved with it. 
So th th this, what we did essentially is, you know, Cassie's explained the, the methodology and, and the way that they collect the, the data and what, what technologies from XNs that we're using for that. And so my kind of role in all this was to compute what we call the loading intensity and, and we'll explain what, what, what that is um, shortly. And obviously to compute that within the running shoes and the racing boots. Um, we say for each body segment, the segments we're interested in um, for this are the lower limb, left and right. I think it's called lower leg. Um, we could have used the, the feet, of course, um, which again will will present some sort of hypothesis about that. Um, and the one that's based at the at the waist. Anyway, so we computed a bunch of a bunch of things for the uh, for the running shoes and the racing boots. Um, obviously, we don't have huge amounts of participants for the some of the scientific statistical tests, but we computed the, co the sort of effect size for fun um, towards the end. Um, so if we flip on to the next slide. So the loading intensity piece is what right step is actually founded upon. Um, it's, um, it's an algorithmic me mechanism to compute musculoskeletal load and we need to sort of define that since people in both health and sporting environments use loading for lots of different things that aren't necessarily the same um, what we're talking about is the application of force and the, the way that force is generated to a to a site where in in this case where the the sensors are located this is based on um Charles Turner, uh, the work he did um, back in sort of from the 70s throughout his career in what happens to bones and muscles when they are in the, as we say, loaded. Um, the, this, these equa this equation is essentially made up of three components, the magnitude of it, so like the, how much uh, force is applied, um, the loading rate, which is um, the sort of speed at which it's applied um, in our case we deal with it from a frequency point of view so like how many hertz are in the signals um, and then the final piece is how long these forces are applied for and these three components collectively um, come out as uh, loading intensity which is what we've uh, what we we, we use um, if we just move on to the next one, I can explain this duration piece is what we do with the data is we chunk it into five second windows. These five second windows allow us to capture a minimum of one, uh, a one gate cycle, like it's a minimum. Um, and that gives us the duration as well, right? So we compute the magnitude, all the frequencies that are within that window, and then the duration. And so that means that we get a loading intensity for each of these windows. And that is the orange, red, and blue, I think it's blue, um, bars that you see on the left-hand side of this, uh, of this slide. So what we're looking at here is just an individual. So when, we, you know, when I started looking at the data, I picked one person and had a look at you know, the, the loading for an individual, for an individual trial um, in shoes and in racing boots. And this one, I believe to be racing boots, but I can't be 100% sure but let's say it is. Um, what we see in the, the, the bar chart is essentially the distribution of the loading intensity from the right leg and the left leg, uh, which is red and orange, and the waist uh, sensor is the blue one. Um, we use that blue one to compute like a general absorption, like the ability to use this force or to absorb it through the body. Um, the top left, this is something we've recently sort of uncovered, let's say, is that we, we focus quite a bit on this frequency uh, and how each limb is generating these different frequency responses. Um, and what this data is essentially showing us is that the, this particular individual is favoring the right side substantially over the left side, even including the turning aspect. And Essentially, the left leg is what you could refer to as offloaded in the sense that it's not generating the same level of loading, both from a magnitude point of view and from a frequency distribution point of view and leaving the left leg to sort of drag or waggle behind it. Um, the top right graph is essentially just really confirming that the right side is doing a lot of the work. 
this is just the difference in the frequency response. So for every frequency we uh, are analyzing, I think we were doing this at 60 hertz, so it's up to 30 hertz that is detectable. We're seeing that you know the right side is is dealing with the, the magnitudes of these frequencies are much higher on the right side than uh, compared to the left side. And and this is just an indication that okay for this particular individual in this particular trial there seems to be some you know loading imbalance there some seems to be loading differences in magnitude and the types of frequencies that are being generated by the individual when they're performing the um, the sprinting task so next one if you don't mind the so we did this across all the five participants um, we did the three trials and then we started to, you know, we, we averaged them out um, across uh, boots and across racing boots. And again, we started to look at, you know, what happened to each, each of the people when they were doing this. Um, I'm not sure what you can see numbers wise, but the, the numbers themselves aren't, aren't really important. One thing is that's really important is this increase. So we see from a left, right and waist, right, that with a racing boot, the loading intensity overall is higher, uh, but on every limb, um, left, even the left side, which we saw in that previous individual who wasn't using that left side as much, it's, it's still increasing. So there is, a, there is a substantial difference between people that are running in this task when they're wearing racing boots and when they're wearing running shoes. And it's frightening. We, we were sort of quite surprised at how much of the increase. We expected there to be one, but this was quite large. Uh, to say the least, and you can sort of, ex, you know, just try and imagine yourself if you went running in a running shoe and then you took your, your your running shoes off and went trying to do the same kind of running, that feeling of what that happens to your mechanics, what happens to the, you know, what you might feel underfoot, how that might translate through the body. And, and this is something we thought, well, okay, you know, there's something going on here with the, um, with these racing boots that that's out of the control of the of the athlete or the mechanic in this case right it's something they just have to have to deal with and unfortunately that's uh, as cassie alluded to it's not designed for the human performance it's designed to stop your legs burning off um so you know th at this point we're sort of seeing here that we've got this quite substantial increase it, it should be noticed that you know there's four out of five of them so one of these guys did something unexplainable to me being sitting out sitting over here on uh, on the other side of the computer screen the uh there's always one um and it'd be interesting to see what what was going on there now i have a again i have a hypothesis that you know it when the loading becomes sort of too great or too much of a shock that you sort of will shy away from applying that load that you're used to like if, you, if you feel like you can't handle it then you might change your mechanics and you might you might sort of go into your shell a little bit to be like, well, my body doesn't like this, it hurts. Um, and that, that, that's just a hypothesis that obviously we don't have any uh, fact on that. We, this is just a, well, what happened to this guy type uh, discussion. Um, so this is a sort of general picture of what we computed uh, and what we started to find. Um, I'm not sure what's next actually on the, ah, uh, yeah. So we can we can look at symmetry um, using the same kind of um, you know approach we saw on the previous slide where the red and orange are the left and right legs so we can compute some some varying degrees of symmetry um, you know which favors which so we we can obviously see it in those those um, in those graphs but it's it, it's interesting to sort of look at it across all trials and look at it across all of the the runners and and not just to see hey there's a there's a symmetry difference which we see anyway but more to see well what a, what does that how does that symmetry change when we put um, someone in running shoes versus the racing boots like does it get worse does it get better we've seen um i've seen when i've done this in this kind of symmetry stuff in just general you know people running on a treadmill sometimes it gets better um so it was interesting we, we wanted to look at it from uh we know that there's some imbalance so we can see that uh from the graph but how does the loading affect that um if we if we think about it like in other sports where we wear uh things like 
football boots is a big one in the UK right now for, for female football players. Like, is that something that's actually contributing to injury incidents? Uh, we don't, people don't know yet necessarily, but there's a probably quite a strong hypothesis that it is. In this case, we can see that like, if we've got this, um, we've got this asymmetry and as we use the racing boots, the asymmetry gets worse and that puts us at a uh, increased risk of injury, right? So we have, um, the left side, in the case of the individual we saw being offloaded, we have a right side that is taking all of the funky stuff. Um, and that means that if for some reason that left leg was called into action, um, you know, maybe unconsciously or in an emergency situation, there could be, you know, quite a substantial problem induced by that. Um, and so, you know, from the study here, what we're looking at is this uh, is purely to do with boots. You know, we could conclude from this boots are bad um, for what they're trying to achieve when it comes to um, performing in a pit stop. And yeah. right. So the conclusions that we've sort of come to currently, um, we know the racing boots uh, induce this higher loading um, experience that all of the, the areas that we analyze, the, the waist, left and right limb. The loading increases are favored on the dominant side, which we, we might sort of expect. Um, there's, higher, there's higher frequency content in the boots. So that's what, so if we think back to our, the loading, uh, the way that we compute musculoskeletal loading, it, high frequency will favor high loading um that's just the way that that's just the way it is um so if we generate high frequencies we'll generate higher loading um and that's something we can infer is happening within the racing boots high frequencies are being generated compared to a running shoe again it, you might find that to be an obvious statement in running shoes designed to reduce loading and, and thus designed to reduce high frequency content um there's a whole uh webinar on that um to come probably um the other thing we've got that if we when we put them in the racing boots the symmetry uh, worsens we've just seen that um and therefore the conclusion is that there's a risk that these individuals are being placed at risk to perform their job um and then it's a matter of how do we uh, as a collective reduce that risk and there's you know a multitude of ways one might address that Right. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, so once I got the results back and discussing it with Mike, had to sort of go away and think about how we actually, now we've understood the results from the problem, what's the next step in actually trying to solve the problem? So being in the gym, moving to unilateral exercises for the guys during the sessions, that's going to help with those asymmetries. Everyone has a natural asymmetry anyway, so it doesn't help strengthening up a weaker side. But with the amount of loading that they are having to withstand, even if we in, we decrease the difference between the limbs, it's still going to happen once they're in the boots. So it took a lot of thinking outside the box for myself. And yes, we're asking our mechanics to that put the car together and bolt the car together to be athletes but at the end of the day they're mechanics and there's no real sport out there with research in terms of their shoes having to be fireproof and functional to run so I was thinking what sort of other occupations out there that sort of have to run but their equipment has to be functional and protect them and firefighters and military came to mind so I spent a lot of time researching their equipment, what they use, what studies are being done. And I found a, quite a few that actually looked at loading that was seen in the spine when they're in their fireproof boots or the military boots. And so one of the studies did look at using inner soles to place in those boots because they're not going to change them. They are what they are. So... I found those inner soles. We purchased them. We're going to use them in the Bahrain race. Um, it's not going to fix the problem at all, but I hope that it 
will in the meantime as a short-term solution reduce some of the loading that these our crew members are experiencing so once we come back from Bahrain race we'll get them in the excellent sensors again and just check the data and see if there has been improvement there might not be there might be but at least we're trying to find something but outside of that our long-term solution is to develop a fireproof booth boot with some companies we have quite a few companies that are talking to us to help develop that but that's long term we might not see that for six months or more but it still means that if it's six months down the track we've already started our season for next year and the same problem happens next year so we are hoping that inner souls so some improvement and that sooner rather than later we get a new designed boot for the guys that helps them perform better in a pit stop and also reduces that loading. So that's our plan at the moment. So I wanna say thanks to Mike for all your work on this. It's been a great help. And we welcome any questions. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, Cassie and Mike for uh, explaining this in this very nice uh, presentation. I think some really good outcomes and some nice results you can take back uh, and hopefully with this partial solution that it will improve for the for the page crew. So very interesting. We got a few questions. So I'll put them up here. There was a first question from John. Um, and he said, have you identified shoe characteristics that influence these altered mechanical distribution? For example, heel to toe drop, shank stiffness, etc." Cassie, do you want that or shall I? Yeah, get crack I that? can take it. There, there's a few things I think in these boots. Um, these boots and these soles, because they're designed to withstand fire, the foam in them is completely dense. So it feels like you're running on concrete. So the actual molding of the shoe and the flexibility to be able to go mid foot and push off during running is pretty non-existent. So without that movement, you will start to change your mechanics higher up on the chain. But it's again, something we need to go further and identify with. We have a few plans in place for that, but our first step is just to identify, is there a difference? And then we need to pinpoint which differences do we need to actually change to help improve that. I, okay. Just before, I'd like to add to that actually, because it's, it's, it's an interesting question posed to, one assumes to Cassie being the one who's day to day running the racing team. And you can imagine like if you if you think about what it takes to run a racing team and how many pieces of the puzzle that are in fact any sports team that you, you can't do everything at once. And I, I think one of the things that Cassie's done here in, in the actions is that the she's got the attention of the shoe manufacturer. Right. So the shoe man, we, we now know that there's problem. Right, whether the shoe manufacturer likes that or not, that's that's it's it's a thing, and it's something that we, you know, working with Cassie, consider to be, you know, a thing that needs to be addressed. Right, so I I think this question is a great one and one that should be, you know, forwarded to the shoe manufacturers, right, and they should be bringing their their shoes to the table where we will test um, test the hell out of them and equally you know say whether this is a shoe or not and and the com competition in manufacturers in motorsport is a is a thing so like they should bring this to the game in the same way that you know it actually it's a bit sad really in 2023 that we took that the, they took to the media about football boots and women's football um and the question needs to be posed to nike adidas those people that are sort of producing this shoe um, and having those things validated before they even get out, quite frankly. So I think it's a great question and one that um, we should have a shoe manufacturer in here to answer. Yeah, it's a, it's a good addition, Mike. Thank you for that. Uh, hopefully they, uh, they will somehow uh, see this webinar and hopefully it will. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
I have another question for you guys. Um, this one is from Thomas. Uh, Thomas asked, uh, maybe Cassie, you can answer this one. Um, how much time do they sit? And then uh, when they sit, do you know at which, which knee angle they sit? Um, so if we're talking, it will depend if we're in a race day or if we're in a practice day. And what I mean by that is if we have FP1, our free practice one, that goes for an hour and a half. And then we have free practice two in the afternoon that goes for an hour and a half. So we're on, only on track for three hours in one day on days like that. So the guys really don't sit because they're in the session, running about, doing setup changes, on the go for an hour and a half. As soon as the car comes in, they have to do all of their mechanical work ready for the next session. So they're probably pretty much on their feet for nearly eight hours straight without sitting down. But if we're in a race, we will have stints where they are sitting down because they don't need to do anything else while the car goes around and around and around until it fuels. So we do actually have, we've bought some new chair, camp chairs that are easy to pack. It's not always going to be the right answer, but anything we have in motorsport needs to be able to pack up into quite small spaces because we have a lot of kit to take in shipping containers. So we do have some recliner chairs that do um, have the legs that come up and that allows them to recline. So their knee flexion would only roughly be about 20 degrees with their feet elevated during a race. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, thanks, Cassie. I have another question from Elliot. Elliot says, first, thank you for the talk. Uh, and he asked, um, did you consider measuring other metrics like uh, ground contact time? No. <laughs> um, the, in, the, in the space and the constraints of time and, and in the interest of getting things up and running, we didn't. Um, the... I think the 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 way that Cassie and I uh, met and the problems and solutions that we have uh, currently are, you know, primarily this uh, musculoskeletal loading aspect. I think it's an interesting point because there's other player people in other sports that um, perhaps have done it, have got have got sort of understanding that way round, and then still struggle on the musculoskeletal uh, musculoskeletal loading aspect. I think adding uh, into this, you know, multitude of activity, um, whether we do longer types of running to establish symmetries and general sort of running technique, whether we look at multiple change in direction type activities, whether we simulate, well, we actually, when we met, we first simulated the full pit stop and just looked at overall accumulative loading per pit stop. Um, I think there's parameters to do with Gates, I think there's probably parameters to do kinetic parameters that could be looked at, um, that could be looked at across joints. That could be, you know, there's a lot of could be in all this. Um, yeah. What I'd like to sort of go back to is the is the problem solution approach that Cassie's taken in this to get us, you know, to get a step further in the understanding. Uh, I think we can hypothesize a lot, and I think from in some conversations I've had from a software point of view, we spend a lot of time hypothesizing and bringing in, oh, we need the perfect study and we need the perfect everything. And, and, you know, but actually in, in this approach, we get some answers quite quickly. Um, we turn it around quite quickly. We can start to then decide how we can iterate on that, um, improve our understanding, improve our knowledge and bring the right people to the table in terms of in this case, shoe manufacturers uh, and, and, and stakeholders of the team, right? Because that ultimately these mechanics are an asset um, that needs uh, protecting just like a, a football player. Um, so I think, you know, that these other metrics, I think they're really important. And I think they'll be, they will be brought in over, over time, that's for sure. Okay, thanks, Mike. It's a, I think it's a good explanation. There was another question from Andrew that also mentioned like, hey, um, these measurements are purely based on running, of course. And how about when they want to stop suddenly or change direction? What does happen with all the data and the influences? But I think this, uh, yeah, this answer you just gave also answers that question as well. That of course there are constraints, but with this, mm -hmm. yeah, problem-solving solution and this this approach that, uh, yeah. 
Absolutely. If you can get somewhere. So, I've, Andrew, if the question is not rightly answered, feel free to, to put it in the chat. And otherwise, um, I hope it was answered uh, with the other uh, answer of Mike. I'd just like to add in to Andrew's um, <clears throat> question. Yes, it is purely about running and the mechanics do so much more than that in their movement patterns, but we have to start somewhere. Yeah. And the issue that we have is there is no biomechanical research done on mechanics. There's a few physiological studies out of Michigan State that look at NASCAR pit crew and IMSA pit crew, but there's no biomechanics out there. So we are starting from the ground up. So we need to start with projects that we can manage. I myself um, are the only one at Jota. I run their pit stop training. I do all of their exercise programming. I do all the analysis and I go to events. So with the, with Mike, he's been a big help to get this going. So yes, definitely we're going to consider all of that, but we sort of need to start somewhere. So we're not saying that they only do running but we're saying this is the start and we've established yeah. a difference. Now we've got a new direction to go. Okay. Thank you, Cassie, for, uh, for adding. I think that's a good explanation. Um, so there's a question from Saba. Uh, he's asking, can the weight of the shoe be altered? Um, yeah, I don't think so, but uh, maybe you have a short answer to that question. Uh, so the weight between different brands we have tried does differ. So there's not necessarily by any FIA regulation that the boots have to be a certain weight, but for ease of movement, you don't want them heavy anyway. So yeah. when building a new boot, that is definitely something we consider. Also airflow within the boots, whether the mechanics feel hot in the boot, that's also going to be consideration as well. Okay. Thanks, Cassie. I have a question from John. Um, He's, uh, he's asking, are you just going to have the mechanics wear the insoles during the race? Because normal protocol for providing insoles uh, involves a trial, wear, and break-in time. Um, did you consider that? Maybe it's not, not a question, more like a comment, but it's a good one, um, I guess. Yes, John, you are correct. That is generally a normal protocol. And so we have had the mechanics wearing them during pit stop practice this past three and a half weeks since I've got them delivered. So they have had a break in time before they go to Bahrain. Um, just didn't want to have based on different foot types and things like that. We didn't want to have something in the shoe that they just have to wear straight away for 12 hours. We did need them to try for an hour at a time, three days a week and then building up. So we have addressed that. Okay, thanks, Cassie. Um, I have another question from Amber, and then I'm going to switch tablets because my tablet uh, battery is dying. Mm -hmm. So I'll quickly run out of the screen. Um, Amber is asking, did you apply the sensors on or in the booth, uh, boots? And did you have any issues with the sensors staying in place in such a quick and dynamic movement? I know the answer, but I'm, <laughs> I'm giving the stage to you guys. Um. So when we've done pit stop and we've put these on during pit stop and the running, um, we get the crew to undo their shoelaces and stick them in the top of the shoe. They do their shoelaces up and then the pit stop boots also have a strap that go over the top. So they're under shoelaces and under straps. And so far that has worked and we haven't had anyone move anything move about. So that's how we have combated that. So back again. Um, so there's another question uh, from Tumalo. He says, would foot type in addition to the boots floss, uh, sorry, in, in addition to the boot floss contribute to loading of the boot, therefore ultimately changing the biomechanics of a person? Could you repeat that, please? Sure. Um, he says, basically he says, would the foot type influence the biomechanically, uh, biomechanics ultimately? Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, in, from, from our an analysis perspective, yes, uh, things that 
the way people put their feet down, the way they pronate, supinate, all these kind of actions will play a role in in how they um, absorb or generate or apply and forces get applied. So I would I would certainly hypothesize that that, that would be the case. Uh, and that that's been sort of looked at in uh, no other sports and in healthcare, you know, where foot function. Uh, I mean, you can find specialists on foot function, like people who spend their entire life dedicated to the to the foot, um, and you know how these things move and articulate. They will influence the rest of the the outcome, right? And that's when we're looking. The foot is the first thing that hits the ground in its ability to to generate and absorb these these forces that go uh, trans transfer through the body. So um, something that allows you to be able to do that is probably quite useful assuming you've got good function that is okay thanks mike um i have a question from christopher christopher is asking am i correct that you are using acceleration data from the imus as a proxy for muscular load if so how reliable of a proxy is it you are half correct in the acceleration plays a role yes the the three parameters uh, involved in muscular skeletal load is acceleration or the magnitude of that, the frequency response of the signal in its entirety. So that would include frequencies in this case up to 30 hertz. Uh, generally, we would uh, apply some kind of cutoff around 10 um, just because we, the human body itself doesn't move like that. Although there are some arguments that um, generated frequencies can be higher than, than 10 hertz that can play a role in, in muscle, muscle and bone degeneration, for example. Uh, skin resonance is around 10 hertz, I believe. So we've got to take into account uh, that, which we could apply things like notch filters to, to accommodate that. But to answer the, the actual answer to the question is that it's acceleration, it's frequency, it's the summation and multiplication of the two pieces, along with this five second window. Uh, in terms of the reliability, the studies that have been done on this uh, you know, date back, you know, I think 2014, 2015, and recent recent papers have looked at the all of the sort of let's call them bone loading equations, and there's like three or four of those. Um, you've probably, if you're thinking around acceleration data, you're probably thinking of peak accelerations or peak strain acceleration equations that that do that they they don't track as well um but they you know they have been used as surrogates um in in other areas um what we try to do is we our sort of research and algorithm is related to how bone remodels and the effect of the frequency and forces that actually applies to a bone itself and this is uh, quite a double-edged sword in in the sense that you can you can load in a certain way that, that promotes healthy bones, but you can also load in a certain way that will break you. Um, and we don't want that bit. Okay, thanks, Mike. Good, good answer. Um, I have, uh, it's not more, it's a, not a question, it's more like a, re a proposal. Um, the question from Paul is, does the boot increase loading or does the runner reduce loading? It would be interesting to compare barefoot uh, running, especially with research linking movement patterns, differences to barefoot and short runners. So, yeah, I don't know if you have a response or a reply to that. Um, thanks, Paul. I think it can be a bit of both. Just looking at one of the mechanics that were the anomaly. Um, just knowing how he works and how he moves and training him. He is a self-preservation person, so he would automatically change and try and reduce as much loading as possible when he's uncomfortable. So I think that can definitely be a thing. And then there's other ones that won't identify that and the boot could increase it. So it's definitely a direction that we could look at to make sure when we are developing the boot, we're developing the right boot. Okay, thanks, Cassie. I have a similar sort of question uh, from previous question from Mustafa. He's asking how can the boot's mechanical property, like stiffness, affect the load distribution on the lower limb? I guess the, the answer Mike gave on the, yeah, the properties of the shoes and hopefully, um, yeah, these manufacturers 
taking this into account is uh, is covering that answer. Um, mm -hmm. But Cash your mic if you disagree. Let me know. Um, I have three more questions. Thomas is asking: Have you found ankle support is better than low top shoes? Uh, we haven't actually looked at that just because FIA regulations say that the pit crew have to be in a boot that is above the ankle for fire safety. Oh. So okay. it's not something we you could we could look at it, but it might not necessarily apply just because of the regulations we have to fit into. Yeah. Okay. Good answer. Um, I have here John asking. Are there any, any FIA regulations that prevent you from instrumenting pit crew with sensors during the practice and or race situations to look at cumulative loading during the real world, world conditions? Unfortunately, yes, there is FIA regulations. Um, you might have seen in F1 the issues with the jewellery and things like that. It is written in the regulations that we are not allowed to have any sort of wearable on a mechanic or a driver, any sort of whoop data, heart rate, catapult, any sort of sensors. We could, the best we could sort of get in the real world is when we go private testing, we stick the sensors on the mechanics and get them that way. But as far as at the moment for racing, we are a bit hampered by what we can and can't do based on FIA regulations. Okay, thanks, Cassie, clear answer. Um, I have actually a quant an answer for or a question for myself. That's also nice. So John is asking, uh, did you have issues with the sensors drift over 12 hours of capture? Did you have interference with mag magnetometer measurements because of all the metal and machinery? How did you address these um, or the other IMU uh, issues you might have? So yeah, with our IMU system, um, we have magnetic immunity. So on the back, there are algorithms taking into account all the... Um, interferences of the data and solving that. So with the XSense, currently we are the only system in the world who can provide you with a magnetically immune system that has no drift. So from the moment we are calibrated, if you stand in the same position for two hours, three hours, 10 hours, doesn't matter, the avatar will be in the same position and there will be no drift. So um, yeah, that's a, a very nice feature we have from XSense. And that's why actually Cassie is able to collect this type of data in a practice session or in a garage. And it's the same thing we also do uh, in all other kinds of application areas for sports, also for health, for ergonomics, measuring in factories. Um, that is one of our key features and we're very happy with that. And that allows us to get into this, yeah, like ecologically valid um, conditions. So I hope that is answering uh, your question, John. And yeah, <coughs> Cassie and Mike can, uh, can tell you if it works like that because yeah for me it's more more or less subjective but i think they have more uh, objective opinion on that so how did you um, encounter these situations uh, cassie and mike um for me it's been really easy to use accents within that we have radios there's so much within a garage and it's been really easy to use during a test session i have used other imus at universities i have been at and I don't know if they would stand up to that. So it has been good that I know I can get a reliable signal wherever. Um, so I can sort of get race as much as applied race data versus training data to make sure how we're training will transfer to our races. So from my experience, it's been positive. Thank you, Cassie. Um uh, there was one last question from Thomas in the in the chat. Um, he asks, how long is it before the user gets to see their metrics? So from our side, from Xsense, you can see the metric live. So you have all the acceleration data, for example. You can plot them, stream them into any software platform you might like. Um, from the analysis part, uh, I think Mike would be the guy to, to ask the yeah. question to. So, uh, yeah, so in, it's instantaneous. And I say instantaneous within, you know, you blink and it'll be there. Um, what the way this process works, we right have developed a, a back end platform for the analysis of uh, both the XN's dot data using our applications and equally um, using the Awinda system uh, output as an input to our analytics platform. 
Um, so the way that that works, and actually I built that for Cassie because we were doing a lot of analysis here and this would take a long time with something like MATLAB or scripting, which, you know, that's how I originally started, right? So that was writing a gallon of Python scripts and, you know, that quickly gets cumbersome. Um, so we turned it into a platform and it's literally you select in our upload piece, you select a window, you upload your Excel file, and then by the time you, you've found your the person you want to analyze and, and click report, um, it's uh, it's all there. So that stuff that we saw in that first slide with the bar charts, the frequency difference graphs, and the uh, offloading loading quadrants, all of that gets computed. And I'm I'm a I say I'm a software engineer, so I, I used to print on the top of the application how fast it was to compute because I'm a bit geeky like that. Um, so if it was anything more than a couple of seconds, I wouldn't be very happy about it. Sounds good. Yeah, very nice. Um, this concludes the questions we have, and it's also very nice because also time is uh, is gone. <laughs> we are uh, in an hour, so perfect timing. Um, I'm uh, going to close my laptop. I want to ask uh, or thank everybody for joining this webinar. Uh, like I said, if you want to rewatch it or have some questions afterwards, let us know. We'd be happy to answer them for you. Um, also, I want to give a special thanks to Cassie and to Mike uh, for um, providing us with this very insightful information and um, for teaming up together with Xsense to yeah, make, your, uh, make your analysis and your research work. So um, thanks for that. And um, there's nothing left for me to say than wishing you guys a very nice day or evening or wherever you are, and um, hopefully we'll see you back next time at one of our webinars. Thank you so much, guys, and thanks for hosting, Jordi. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you for attending. Our emails are on the start of the slide, so if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very thanks much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.